Okay, very good. Well, thanks for doing this. You bet. Um, well, I'd like to ask a little bit about your early life. You're a Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania native. That's correct. That's correct. Uh, what was your early life like? Who were the major influences in, in your life back then? Well, not surprisingly, my, my parents and my family were uh, fundamentally influential. I, I grew up in a, a railroaders household. Everyone in Altoona, Pennsylvania was affiliated in one way or another with the, with the Pennsylvania Railroad. My dad was a fireman and then eventually a, a, an engineer. So we lived by the railroad clock. It was a, a, a good blue collar, solid working class uh, neighborhood and family. They were uh, good Presbyterians and uh, good work ethic and, and high, high expectations. So they, uh, their influence continues to be very important for me. Like a lot of people who uh, managed to get through the depression, uh, nothing was more important to them than that their children would uh, somehow have a better life than they had. And I've been deeply grateful for that all my life. Were there any ministers in the family? Uh, no ministers in the family uh, at all. Uh, interestingly, uh, my dad's family were uh, Methodists. My mother's uh, deeply Presbyterian, so we became Presbyterian. And the ministers at our Presbyterian church uh, uh, played a, a role in my life, but not in our family. Well, uh, what, what led you into the ministry? A lot of people talk about you know, the call to ministry. Others uh, find it as a kind of an accidental pathway. Uh, great question. People often want to know at what point in your life did you know and uh, for me uh, the call to ministry was a, a long process which in many ways continues to this day and not a single event. Uh, I, I was always comfortable uh, in the church of my childhood, uh, liked being around it, but as I uh, matured began to ask uh, substantive intellectual questions about faith and belief and credibility and is this stuff true? and and uh, was uh, was compelled by the fact that uh, Christian faith is uh, is intellectually challenging, and that some uh, the older I got, the more I realized uh, that some of the most brilliant people in history were were also compelled by the notion of God and by the Christian faith, and so so it was uh, in in that way it was kind of a circuitous route, but uh, it it led me to uh, the University of Chicago Divinity School. Uh, where a college advisor told me uh, you could go without any risk to uh, your future. They didn't particularly care whether you became a minister or not. They provided a theological education. Anyhow, uh, I find myself uh, being hooked uh, intellectually and spiritually uh, by the intellectual and academic rigor and honest faithfulness of uh, the Divinity School. When did it, it, so it occurred to you, it, it occurred in college. Is that fair to say? It, yes. Uh, probably before then I was thinking about what to do with my life. I was kind of avoiding the notion of ministry. I didn't particularly want anything to do with it, but a college advisor uh, said, uh, Buchanan, the kind of questions you're asking, why don't you take a year off and, and go to divinity school? You'll never have an opportunity like this uh, again. It was uh, between Korea and Vietnam, so there was no imminent uh, uh, war to go fight. And so I took a year and came to the University of Chicago, and that's where I, that's where I became hooked. Your ministry led you into, I believe, Indiana and Ohio after that? Traditional uh, kind of thing? Yes, very traditional. Uh, in fact, during uh, during Divinity School, my wife and I moved to Dyer, Indiana, to a very small church, but it had a, it provided housing and a couple of dollars a week, and uh, I decided to give it a try. And, uh, and we stayed there for six years and uh, learned a lot about ministry and people and a lot about the church, and then moved on from there to Lafayette, Indiana. Uh, Purdue University, a edge of the city congregation of young adults and kids, and and so I've been pretty much involved in traditional Presbyterian parishes uh, all my life. And you came here in 1985, is that right? That's correct. Yeah. It's quite a, quite a jump up from the smaller churches. Well, actually, the church I came from was the downtown church in Columbus, uh, Broad Street Presbyterian Church, which is one of the great uh, Presbyterian congregations uh, uh, for many many years. Uh, uh, located right in the, in the heart of Columbus. It was not as large as this church, but it was a substantial congregation and continues to be so today. So it gave you good preparation. Yes, it did. It was a multiple staff church with a good tradition of music and outreach into the neighborhood. Um, how, did, how did your personal journey with uh, the ministry uh, continue over the years or grow over the years? You, you've been described as someone who's very much a, uh, known for his inclusivity, who really wants to bring people in and at the same time, 
take the church out to face the uh, challenges that you know, face the community? As is the case with a lot of people my age, uh, uh, the compelling uh, concept for me as I was uh, developing uh, as a young uh, minister was the, the notion of racial inclusivity. Uh, we, we woke up uh, in college to the notion of racism. It had just been an unconscious part of the life of this nation and our culture and my own life and suddenly, in, in fact, it was in a college fraternity. Uh, when. Uh, when someone suggested that we uh, receive a young African-American man and everyone went ballistic, including the National Fraternity Headquarters. Anyhow, that was a sobering experience for me. And uh, then, of course, the Civil Rights Movement uh, uh, emerged while I was in uh, University Divinity School, and I became deeply involved in, a, in the life of a, a multiracial parish on the south side of Chicago and, and uh, deeply committed to the civil rights movement. So my notion of Christianity as a kind of a public faith and the church as a, a player in society was uh, nurtured and formed in that, those exciting and, and difficult days. We'll give an interesting, uh, in, in talking with people here like Rabbi Shalman, uh, who was a laureate a few yeah. years ago, Martin Marty, and others who've been active in the uh, uh, religious life of this community, uh, it's really taken on a vitality here in the last uh, couple of dozen years as, as the churches and the synagogues and so on ha have really started to have a public, a, a public life here in, in the community of Chicago. Uh, I, I think that's uh, one of the unique things about this community. There's a healthy uh, interfaith uh, dialogue or, or conversation that's been going on uh, for many years. Uh, it's become incredibly important uh, in the last years, and uh, fortunately, Chicago has been blessed by people like Sean, Rabbi Shalman and Marty, who for years and years have understood that we need to we need to know one another and talk to one another in this uh, in this nation. Here, here at Fourth Presbyterian, um, you've had an active outreach for a number of years. It looks like it goes back prior to uh, your, your coming here. How how um, how intrinsically, how much of an intrinsic part of the outreach of this church is uh, kind of box box the question there a little bit? But outreach is vital to this church. It, seems. it, it could not be more vital. In fact, uh, that's a great question because in the '60s, uh, while well, I was in divinity school. Uh, and a lot of urban churches were were uh, responding to with fear to the urban unrest, the student unrest, and a lot of a lot of major metropolitan churches were uh, closing their doors or locking their doors up tight. Uh, my predecessor, a great Welshman by the name of Elam Davies, did the exact opposite and opened the doors to this uh, fairly elite, uh, wealthy church and, and brought in neighbors, brought in youngsters from Cabrini Green, started a counseling center. Uh, all of that. Uh, I think in a wonderful way, uh, refocus the attention of this church from itself to the world where it ought to be anyhow. And in the process, uh, of course it was controversial. Some people didn't like that, didn't think the church had any business doing that sort of thing, but it's my opinion that it saved this church's soul. And to this day, uh, this church is shaped and formed uh, by a gospel that, that just simply demands to be expressed outside in the streets of the city so it's it's it could not be more important to us so it's it, for you it's it seems like a perfect fit it it uh, thank you for saying that i think that every day i, I think there just couldn't be a better place for me to be uh, in ministry than here uh, you've written extensively about that you have a couple of uh, a couple of books uh, to that uh, on that subject um i believe being church becoming uh, community Is yes that correct? that's correct okay uh, sermons for the city. Churches have to become actively engaged in the city, Is that, in the communities. That, that's the message you, you take to other, to other ministers. That's, uh, that is the message. If we know anything here, it is that. And, uh, and, and it goes right to the heart of the Christian faith. Uh, we're told that the way to live out this business is to somehow figure out a way to give your life away. And I think that applies institutionally as well as personally, uh, that we need to live on behalf of and for the sake of something other than our own security or amusement or, or even our own happiness. We're, we're called to get it out there into the streets. And uh, I just think there's a dynamic set off when, when churches and individuals begin to do that that is uh, energizing and enlivening and, and compelling. Uh, one of the amazing things about this place is that people come here because of that. They come here because they know when they sit in the pews of this place and 
put their money in the plate, it's going to make a difference in, in the quality of life in the world around us. Well, that was one of the figures I saw. It was something like 40% of what the, the churches, I don't know if you would call it income, but funds go to the outreach ministries yes, here. right. That's, that's, that's a huge that's part. I, I, I've been in churches before, and that's a large part of the... It's a major commitment, and has been for many years, and uh, and continues to, to grow. It, it's, it's not a diminishing uh, thing. We, we continue to... Uh, invest more and more of, of our emotional energy and our resources in, in our neighbors. Could you describe a little bit about uh, what the, what programming you have out there? I know through Chicago Lights, there are, you have the Elam Center, you have a number of different things out there, tutoring programs, Cabrini Greens. Well, Cabrini Green, the proximity of Cabrini Green, a mile or so to the west of us, has uh, been a defining element for this church. That's under transition right now, the whole Chicago Housing Authority is. but. But that, that proximity helped us uh, define our mission. And uh, so uh, we invited, my predecessor invited uh, African-American youngsters, mainly African-American youngsters from Cabrini into the church for tutoring. Uh, when I came, we realized that was something that we needed to do even more of and take more seriously. So we expanded that program from about 100 youngsters to about 450 and uh, retain professional leadership for it, by professional educators, and so it's now a very sophisticated tutoring program which brings into this wonderful Gothic building uh, 400 plus uh, youngsters uh, from Cabrini and other urban neighborhoods now. We, uh, we rent buses and haul kids in for an hour and a half or two hours of one-on-one -on -one tutoring with a volunteer once a week. That's important. We uh, have a scholarship program for outstanding youngsters in that program, uh, assuring them that if they, if, if they can do it and want to do it, we'll, may, we'll stand with them as they go on to uh, private schools or to higher education. We have a summer program that does the same thing for 150 or so youngsters. Uh, that in addition to the social service center, which deals with uh, uh, the homeless and needy uh, in this uh, high rent district there are a lot of homeless people it's uh, and and for a lot of them this church is uh, uh, where they can count on uh, being welcome uh, where they can count on uh, facilities to use and a hot meal and a coat if they need it and a referral if they need it and mostly just a, a hospitable you're 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 welcome here i noticed that a little earlier as we were doing some shots around the building it was it was pretty clear that there were some homeless people here and they seemed completely at ease here yes yes uh, and, and we're glad for that. We're grateful for them. Uh, many of them are uh, in various programs at Northwestern Memorial Hospital. So they're people who are not particularly well physically, and uh, we're just privileged to be able to be uh, to be here for them. I'd like to turn a little bit to uh, some of your other work with uh, the Christian Century Magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, I uh, I like the uh, the mission statement you have uh, about Christians. Uh, uh, I can't even read my own writing here, but to a profound engagement with the world, with both the head and heart. It yeah. seems like what you're all about. Well, uh, once again, it was a, a match made in heaven, if you will. Uh, I've been a reader of the Christian Century and have loved what they have uh, been doing and have meant to the world uh, for uh, my entire ministry. So it was a great privilege to be invited to be part of that enterprise. and. Uh, and yes, they, they, they do. Uh, they do engage heart and head. And uh, we, uh, uh, we try to uh, bring to print the, the very best thinking about the complicated uh, theological and social and political issues of the day, uh, but always rooted in the basic uh, good news of, of the Christian faith, of God's love in Jesus Christ. What, what I like about it is in some of the readings I've done, is it, it, you seem to have the, uh, the, I, the central tenet that Christians don't function in a vacuum. Faith doesn't function in a vacuum. It lives in the real world. That's right. Uh, that, that's very much a part of uh, the tradition of this church. It's, it's also very much at the heart of the uh, Presbyterian Reformed tradition that, uh, uh, that Christian faith doesn't call us out of the world, but in, in a very real way calls us into the world in, in the name of Christ. So we're not a we're not a closeted, cloistered uh, version of Christianity. We're worldly. We're, we've got the doors and windows open, and we feel that we need to be out there engaged in the world. With the magazine, uh, just looking at some of the topics that are online today, for example, uh, you're, covering the, you're covering ground in some controversial areas like the U.S. military uh, bases across the world and the right. presence and how that's viewed uh, by, uh, by other countries, other peoples. 
that's uh, that's good. that's some pretty tough stuff. Well, and it's not everybody's uh, cup of tea. There are people who would, uh, and I uh, respect this point of view, who just simply don't want their don't want religion to be too tightly engaged in the world. We we come at it from the very opposite direction. That in order to be faithful, you are called to be engaged. Uh, we try not to be doctrinaire or dogmatic. We try not to say this is the Christian position on that issue or this issue. What we say is that we are called as Christians to be careful and discerning and thoughtful and to bring our faith to bear on the whole range of issues. And, and you bet they're controversial. They're, and, and for that very reason, sometimes people don't want you to mention them. But uh, we think that's what we're called to do. Yeah, and, and some of the other articles I found were, uh very thoughtful, very provoke, provocative. Uh, of course, the, the recent review of the new book on Mother Teresa's life, yes. Be My Light, right. uh, and how someone who, you know, is being canonized for, for her for her good works has had so many what years in an arid desert without the f feeling the presence of God. Right, right. Well, that's an that's an intriguing. Uh, metaphor, I, I think, for what it means to be a postmodern or a modern Christian, if you will. Uh, people want certainty, and, and there are a lot of things about which we can't be certain. And what Christians are called to do is not, they're not called to certainty, they're called to trust. And, and that's what Mother Teresa did. She trusted God and, and gave her all. Uh, even in the dark, uh, darkest nights of the soul, she kept right on loving people in, in God's name. And we think that's a, that's a I think that's a great great metaphor for what faithfulness is. You've been in leadership positions, obviously, uh, with, with, within your faith in, in, a national, in national organizations. Mm -hmm. You've also been representative of the World Council of Churches. Uh, speak to me about, about that uh, dimension of your life. It's, uh, well, I've always been uh, just very grateful for uh, my ecclesiastical tradition, the Presbyterian tradition. And so uh, I've always appreciated it, respected what it has meant in the life of the world, in the life of this nation particularly. We're, We've been here for a long time, deeply involved uh, from the earliest days of uh, pre-colonial or pre-revolutionary days. So it was a great privilege uh, to be elected to be moderator of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church, which is kind of the symbolic head of the denomination for a year. And I had the opportunity to travel uh, throughout the country, uh, visiting uh, Presbyterians coast to coast, but also throughout the world, the Presbyterian partners and mission and our own mission personnel. And that was, just a, a wonderful opportunity and a deeply moving affirmation of the continuing role of, of Christian church in the life of the world. You've had a, a richly varied career in, 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 the, in the church uh, and a lot, of, a lot of challenges. What's, what's next for you? What, what, do you what, what subject intrigues you? What, what would you like to do next? Well, uh, I'm d deeply committed to that Christian Century magazine. Uh, I'm deeply committed to the notion of joining heart and mind, and I have a sense that there are uh, lots and lots of people out there who are hungry for that kind of uh, encounter and that kind of resource. So I'm, I'm hopeful uh, that I'll continue to do that. Uh, I think I've got some important work to do here. Uh, this church is growing; it's expanding beyond the boundaries of the building, and we we need to uh, we need to strengthen this church for the next generation. And then when that's done, I'll get out of the way. Briefly, if, if, talk briefly about about the church itself, the church building here. It's a marvelous, marvelous structure. Well, it's a great story. It's just a great story. Uh, John Timothy Stone, who was the new minister here in 1909, uh, struck a deal with the uh, the leaders of the church. He said, "I'll come from Baltimore, where it's very successful and very comfortable, if you'll agree to build a grand uh, church building." The, uh, the legend around here is that he said the grandest uh, Gothic building west of the Alleghenies. So they they did it. They bought a, an unlikely piece of property on a dirt road outside here, n not much around, and retained the premier Gothic architect of the day, Ralph Adams Cram, and built this uh, stunning uh, neo-Gothic uh, building, which of course now sits in the middle, one of the more interesting and dynamic neighborhoods in the world. It's it's a great building, and, and it's uh, hundreds of people every day come in and just look, and it's such a surprise in the midst of this busy urban neighborhood to have this this little gothic uh, jewel. It's rich with symbolism in a, in, a, in, a, in, a very, in a very real way, isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. Well, and it's, it symbolizes for me uh, uh, this incarnational gospel that calls us to be the body of Christ right in the world, and, and here we are uh, with our doors open and with our garden outside and people coming and going all day long. 
the vehicle past mm. there for just a little bit. That's a urban hazard. Yeah, yeah. Well, if, you, if you're taping in my part of the state, it's usually somebody with a bad muffler. <laughs> The, the, the most hazardous thing that happens here on Sunday morning is uh, Sunday morning is a favorite time for helicopters to deliver heavy machinery to the oh, top of high sure, rise, you know, sure, the air sure, conditioning yeah. and heating. Yeah. And invariably, during 8 o'clock service, you'll hear the yeah, wump of you hear the sky crane go by. Yeah. <laughs> helicopter. Uh, one, one question. Um, I know the church, of course, is, is far more than the, the physical uh, building, but what's it like to preach in a place like this? Well, it's a, it's a great and humbling honor, uh, which uh, uh, fills me with gratitude and uh, a little fear and trembling every week of my life. Uh, one of the amazing things about this place historically is that people come here for serious reasons. You know, you don't have to go to church anymore, and you particularly don't have to go to church in the city. There's a lot of wonderful things to do on Sunday morning. So people uh, come here with uh, business in mind. Uh, they want to hear something that's worth listening to. Uh, uh, they come here with high intentionality, and, and that, uh, uh, that just, uh, I want to say, inspires me, but, but, but it fills me with a, a sense that this is an important, what we're engaged here is it's, it's very important. Yeah, there's a real responsibility. Absolutely. I think I'm pretty much at the end of my questions. Is there anything I haven't touched upon? That oh, I don't think so. Mm been fun. Okay, same here. Same right. here. I think what we'll do is we'd like to go up to the office. All right. And uh, have some